On many Saturday nights, I would uh, usually be texting Ed. He was a diehard Gamecock like myself. And we would usually lament for three hours about what was happening on the TV screens or if one of us was in person at the game. But he would always finish with one text when we were done. And he'd be like, it's tough to be a Gamecock, but God is good. <laughs> and he'd be like, well, brother, preach with power tomorrow. So let us pray. Lord, I, I pray that the words of my mouth may proclaim your power. And I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will descend upon me and upon all who hear your word proclaimed, that we may be transformed by your goodness and your grace through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. When you talk about love, I think many times you, you think about how you see love in God's creation. You think about the love you experience in a place like this. You think about the love that is in your families, the love that is in your homes, the, the love that has impacted you in some way. And for me personally, one of the, the first um, images that comes to my mind when I think about love is my dog, Cooper. And, and, and Cooper is this 80-pound golden retriever who is full of joy, who is full of love. And, and, and throughout my lifetime, I've always had dogs. And, and, and I think about all the different dogs who have shown love. That I think God created them just for the purpose of sharing love. And, and when I think about love, I think about as I come home each day, and I open the door, and right as I open the door, his head is right there. He knows he has perfected the way to get his head right in as soon as he can. And, and, and the next thing you know, he's jumping, and he jumps in place. I don't know if any of your dogs do that, where he just jumps up and down like he's on a trampoline. He doesn't jump on me, but he's just jumping. And it's kind of like watching a bouncing ball. And he's sitting there, and, and he doesn't only just wag his tail. It's like his whole butt wags as he goes. I mean, it's going side to side, and he's just going, and then he's running around. And he's only about two and a half, and I think it was about this time two years ago that I went and picked Cooper up. And, uh, and, and Cooper will follow me, and, and usually we go immediately outside so he can you know, go do his business. But sometimes if I haven't been gone long, then we'll go, uh, go to go to the kitchen, and for some reason, I don't know if any of you have kind of this ritual as you come home. I, I usually, you know, take the keys out, put them on the, the cabinet, and I go right over to the, it's kind of like a bar area in my kitchen, and I put, you know, like my laptop down or something, and I've thought of something, or I know I need to call somebody, or there's something going on, and so I'll sit there, and, and Cooper's still jumping around, because he does this if I've been gone for 10 hours, or if I've been gone 10 minutes. And so he's jumping around and he's running. And, and many times I'll find myself writing down something because I keep a little pad there. And uh, as I was working on the sermon this week, and I'm standing at that same spot writing out my notes, Cooper was jumping around, and then he just kind of falls down. And he makes kind of a, a grunting noise. And he lies right at my feet. Uh, when I bring him to work, he lies right at my feet. When, wherever I go, he lies right at my feet. Because Cooper... In his mind, he has one mission in his life. And that one mission is to share love with me, to share love with his master, and also to share love with everybody else. Because that's all he knows. He knows that he has one job and one job only, and that's the love. And, and so Cooper will recognize that when I come in and, and I'm focused, and sadly, I, I know that it's wrong to admit that maybe sometimes I neglect him, especially if I've only been gone 10 minutes and I'll just let him do his thing. But he lies down right at my feet. And Cooper puts himself in a position so that he can love me. Cooper intentionally places himself at my feet so that he can be there right at the moment when I disengage from my work and I look down like, Cooper! And he is immediately ready, wagging his tail again, ready to share love. And as the body of Christ, we are called to put ourselves in a position where we can love God, 
where at the drop of a hat that we are right there ready to love God, that we're ready to share that love with our neighbors, to share that love with ourselves and with our community. And so when the, the lawyer seeks to trick Jesus and to, to ask him, you know, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus does not even think twice when he pronounces, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And Jesus did not come up with this commandment, but this is a commandment that is found in Deuteronomy. And it's known as the Shema. When in a, it's a two-part prayer. And the first part says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And this prayer that Jesus recites plays a central role in the life and the faith of a practicing Jew. That it played a central role in Jesus' life because the Shema was at the heart of the liturgy in Second Temple Judaism. And it was at the heart of the life, of the prayer life of an ancient Jewish synagogue attender. And it was at the heart and life of Jesus Christ. He woke up and he recited, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Because when they prayed this prayer, they were remembering that we are to place ourselves in a position where we can love God with all our might. That we can love God with all our soul and we can love God with all our heart. And so remembering that God alone is God and that we are called to put ourselves in that position would help them each and every day to love God and to love their neighbor. And so the same Pharisee, the lawyer, hears the second part of Jesus' answer. And Jesus looks at them and Jesus tells them that the second law is that you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you think about when Jesus says this, it really brings out the power of his words. Because Jesus makes this announcement to the Pharisees on a Monday. The day after he came into Jerusalem. The day after he was riding a donkey and he was coming into the streets. And he saw as far as the eye could see. People on either side holding palm branches. Laying their cloaks down before him. And singing, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. And so Jesus has had this great triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But reality hits him on Monday morning. That he's not going to leave Jerusalem the way he came. That before he can leave Jerusalem, that he will be betrayed by one of his closest friends. That he'll be handed over to stand trial before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. That he'll be found guilty and that he will be crucified. And so his neighbor asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, to love your neighbor, to love God. And Jesus didn't just say that we should love. Jesus was the full embodiment of God's love. Because the Author John tells us, for God is love. And because God first loved us, we may be able to love. And so Jesus went to that cross to fulfill God's love and to share his love. And we know that death does not conquer love. That on the third day, that love emerged from that tomb. And on the third day, we declared that love reigns. 
In my opinion, love is the most powerful gift that we have been given to share. Love is wrapped up with forgiveness and grace. And, and what is so great about love is that when you are loved, you feel special. And to remember that God loves each and every one of us. That God looks down and God sees us and God says, you are special. I love you. You are cherished. You are beloved in my heart and I love you. And if you think about in our own lives, when one of our family members or one of our friends loves on us, that we feel special. That we feel as if we're the most important person in the world that day. And, and when we love someone else, to see the joy on their faces, it does not get much better than that. To see what the power of love can do. And as I was thinking about this text this week, I came to the conclusion that you meet only a few people in your life who you know that the moment they met you, they loved you. And the moment I met Ed, I knew Ed loved me. I mean, there was, there was no doubt about it. Like, Ed just, you looked at Ed and you saw love. You saw love in his face. You saw love in the way he would give you a hug, the way he talked about his friends, and the way he talked about Jesus. And, and you would just see love pouring out from him. And as I was thinking about how so many people had been touched by Ed as friends called us, and, and as uh, we discussed about his life, we found out that Ed loved us first, and that Ed made us feel like we were the most special person in the world. And we knew that the reason Ed was able to love us is because he had spent time being present with God, that each morning he woke up and he was present with God, and that as you love God, you are filled with love. That as you respond to love, to God's love, that God fills you with that love. And so when we met Ed that morning or that afternoon, we were positive that Ed had been with Jesus that morning. And that Ed had carried that love of God with him into the halls of Duke Divinity, into the churches he worked in, and into the places he lived. And as you walk down the hall... And as you met this man, who was so full of love, he would always come walking towards you. And he was so jovial. And he would be smiling. And he would stick out his hand. And, and I like to call it the man hug. And he would shake your hand, and then he would just bring you in. And he would just wrap, and he would just hold you. And he would let go of you and say, Walt, man, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. I can't tell you how many times he told me that. Walt, man, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And he would say it to his other friends. And I saw one of my, my buddies posted on Facebook. He said, you know, we all knew that Ed didn't want to be like us, but that we wanted to be like Ed. Because Ed loved God with all his heart. He loved God with all his mind that he would place himself at the foot of Jesus by reading Holy Scripture, because that's the way we love God, by reading Scripture, by praying, by being involved in the church. We love God by coming to worship. We love God by being Christ's hands and feet, by participating in ministries that promote God's justice, that we love God by following Jesus. And so whenever Ed said, Walt, man, I want to be just like you when I grew up, grow up, I would always think, no, Ed, I want to be like you. And I hope that all of us want to be like the great saints of the church, those who have gone before us, those whose lives have impacted us in such a way, and those who we look at we see Jesus Christ just shining through them. So point hope, I hope we can all be like Ed, because Ed was like Jesus. Amen.